Take your Bibles once again, please, and turn back to the book of Zephaniah as we continue to work through this minor but very important prophet of the Old Testament. Zephaniah. If you find Zechariah, keep going to the left, just a couple of pages, you'll see Haggai and then Zephaniah. Just three verses for us this morning, but verses that are, we could spend three months on these verses, but I promise you we're not going to. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Gather together, gather together, O shameful nation, before the appointed time arrives, and that day sweeps on like chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Three short but very powerful, meaningful verses for us today. As we read about Zephaniah's very direct call to repentance. Here we see that God in his grace calls sinners to repent and encourages the faithful. And you might be thinking, well, Pastor Andy, you've already talked about God's grace and calling people to repentance in the, already in Zephaniah. That's true. And I did that on purpose because it's so heavy in judgment and doom and wickedness and sin. It's like we had to highlight God's grace and Call to repentance, but this is the key passage of repentance and grace in this book. And it's made, or it's meant to scare people into change. Scared into change. Have you ever had a moment in your life that scared you, shook you so much that you were like, wow, I've really got to change how I do that? Maybe you went to the doctor and you had a health scare. Maybe it was cancer and you finally realized, oh man, all those years of smoking really have now caused me to have lung cancer. I've got to do something. I've got to change or I'm not going to get better. I won't get to see my grandkids. You get scared to change. Maybe you have clogged arteries and so you change your diet. Maybe you get blood clots and so you start exercising instead of sitting on your duff all the time. Maybe you need a joint replacement or something like that. There's a health situation that comes up and it's just like, oh my goodness, I can't live forever. I've got to do something about this. I can't live forever like this. Maybe you had a parent or a teacher or a coach who gave you the final line that if you cross this, if you don't change this, you're done. You're out of here. Maybe it's a boss. You've got to fix this or we cannot continue in this relationship anymore. You're going to be kicked off the team. You're going to, whatever it might be, Step it up, and it shocks you into changing your behavior. Or maybe, as your pastor has had in the past, you had a close call with speeding, either with an almost causing an accident or losing control on icy roads, or you saw too many police officers whip around and come right behind you, and it's like, oh, i got to change. Or maybe you saw the insurance bill after that last um, speeding ticket, and you're like, I've really got to start slowing down. How long has it been? couple of years. Yeah. So praise God for that. But there are moments in our lives in which we do something or someone cares about us enough to tell us some great truth that will cause us to stop and to think, to ponder, and to change our behavior. This is what we have here at the beginning of Zephaniah chapter 2. We hear the prophet call out. He's, in a sense, admonishing the people, you've got to do this or else. It's calling out to a sinful nation, telling them of the impending judgment that is to come. And so, two main points for our, from our main point overall. God calls a sinful nation to repent. Very simple. I mean, you can't really, to do anything else with it would be to make it more difficult than it is. God is calling a sinful nation to repent. And he shares that with us here in verses 1 and 2. Gather together. Gather together, O oh shameful nation, he says. So far in the book of Zephaniah, we've read about judgment that's coming upon the world and upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their sin. 
God did not pull any punches in declaring just what that judgment would be like. And now we see that the Lord is calling his people to gather together. Again, the same phrase, we see this repeated twice in English, and we know from Tuesday night that that means something important is being said. Pay attention. In the Hebrew, though, this has even greater emphasis and effect. What is really being said here is like, it's the same language that would be used to, self, to tell somebody to rake up the sticks, rake up the loose straw, gather it together, set it in the pile so it can be burned. God is calling his people to gather before they get thrown into the fire. He's referring to his people as worthless straw and sticks that are good for nothing but burning. Reminds us of the parable of the wheat and the tares that Jesus told. That eventually the tares will be pulled up and thrown into the fire. God is trying to get across to his people, you've got to change and you've got to change now. He's trying to scare his people out of their sins, according to the great commentator Matthew Henry. They are a people that has no shame in what they're doing. They're not embarrassed at all, not red-faced, not, oh my goodness, I can't believe he just did that. None of that. They are openly and blatantly sitting, openly and defiantly sitting in much the same way that the nations of Canaan did when the Israelites came through to kick them out of the land in their time of judgment. Judah and Israel aren't even blushing. And if you want to read the full extent of Judah's and Israel's sin, look to the book of Ezekiel. He lays it out very explicitly. It wouldn't even be allowed in most libraries today because it is so blatantly explicit. God is going to go so far as to call them a nation. Not my people. Not Judah. Not Jerusalem here. You're just a nation. Just like everybody else sinful and wicked, turning away from me. You're just a nation. And that would be something that would and hopefully would should shake these, these people up. God is used, they're used to God telling them that he's their special people. We're the chosen people. We've got the temple. I mean, look at what you've done for us in the past. God's like, that doesn't mean anything. You've broken your covenant. You have left me. You have divorced me. He's not trying to just scare Judah, but he's trying to shame them into changing by telling them that they're no better than the rest of the world because they're acting just like the rest of the world. And God's going to treat them as he's treated the rest of the world. <coughs> think about the time when he flooded the world. Think about Egypt. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Israel, the northern ten tribes, they were swept away by the nation of Assyria. So God is telling them to gather together like sticks and straw, which are worthless, ready for the fire, just like the rest of the world. And this gathering is for the purpose of being reminded of who the Lord is so that they would return to him, that they would repent of their sin and not be judged. Three times, again, repetition in the Bible means pay attention. This is going to happen. This is serious. It's meant to grab our attention. Three times they're told to gather before the day of the Lord comes. Because once judgment comes, it's too late. You're done. You've made your decision, and now you're going to have to live with it. Before they are swept away into the angry fire of the Lord's anger and wrath. Get together before this happens. Before this happens. Today is the day of salvation. It's the same language from chapter 1. The day of the Lord. Meaning that God is on the move for judgment. And all who do not repent will experience what it's like to have God as their enemy. So he's saying, I have prepared, I have a pre-planned day of judgment, a day in which my righteous, just, and holy anger towards sin and sinners will be dealt out. Come back to me. Come back to me. Gather together so that we can have a worship service, so that you can be reminded not only of the promise you made at Sinai, and the promise you made under King Hezekiah, and the promise you made under King Josiah, during the short revival that took place during his reign, to follow after me, and to walk in my ways, and to come back to me again. The language here reminds us that God's anger is inflamed. His nostrils are flared. He's getting ready to lay out his judgment. The time of release is coming. Repent before it's too late. This is what we would call good old-fashioned fire and brimstone preaching. Southern Baptist Gospel Pastor, pound in the pulpit. You've got to 
to change. You've got to repent. You've got to change now, today. This is Zephaniah's version of that. John the Baptist is going to have a very similar message. Jesus will begin his time of ministry. Repent and believe. Turning back to God is what it means to repent. And what God is looking for here is exactly what every human throughout time has needed to do. All people are sinners, and all sinners are called to repent, to turn away from their sin, to turn away from being their own master, from living contrary to God's word and law, and to fully embrace him as God and master and Lord of their life, and to embrace his ways as their ways. Repentance means dying to self, as Jesus calls it. Embracing the life that only God can give. And this comes by faith, no matter which side of the cross we live on, as the Apostle Paul demonstrated in the book of Romans. By faith in God and his revealed word and his promises to deal with our sin. Recently, the word revival has been making headline news. Asbury, Cornerstone, various other places, some are wondering if this is a real revival that's happening at this university in Kentucky or not. The only way to truly know for sure is, number one, to be there and what's happening. I don't know what's happening there for sure. I've read many accounts that this is really good or this is really bad. This should, you know, I've heard both sides of the story. And until I'm actually there and experiencing it, I can't really say for sure what's really happening. But what I can say is what God's Word says about revival. The only way to know for sure, is that there's repentance of sin and that there's an embracing of Christ as Lord and Savior, turning away from what I was and becoming what I can be in Christ. That is what is to be called and proclaimed to everybody in every church, every true church, all of the time. Every church service is, in effect, a revival opportunity because we are to come together in submission before our Holy Heavenly Father and Lord and Savior. We are sinners in need of your grace, and it's only because of your grace that we are here. All true believers of any time are known by their fruit. Any true revival will show itself to be true by how the people who were there start to live and behave. Many of the greatest missionaries and pastors of the last 300 years began and were called to their ministry by revivals like the one that is similar to the one happening in Asbury. Any true repentance and true revival will, will be known by its results. Just like in our life, we will know if we are truly believers by the life that we begin to live after professing faith in Christ. Is it producing more righteous and obedient living? Today we have a fuller understanding of salvation. We know that Christ endured the wrath of God towards sin and sinners upon the cross. He took hell for us on that cross so that we would not have to experience his wrath in hell for eternity. And then he was raised to life, for he had no sin of his own to pay for, and so death could not hold him. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news, that he had come to pay the debt sinners owed to a holy God. This is how a holy and just God can forgive sinners and offer them forgiveness in everlasting life, punishing sin and also forgiving sinners through the cross of Jesus. One thing that we need to note here is that this passage, Zephaniah 2, 1, 2, and 3, actually the whole book, but specifically here, is that Zephaniah is talking not just about his immediate situation. Zephaniah may or may not have realized this, but the prophets see mountain peaks. They see a really big mountain peak in front of them, and then a really bigger mountain peak even beyond that, but they don't know the distance between the two peaks. He's talking about what's immediately happening to Judah and Jerusalem in his time, the 620s B.C., and he's also talking about a time yet to come in which God is going to say to his people, gather together, gather together before the final great day of the Lord's wrath will come. And that is a time yet future for us. We're going to look more into that next week. The Jews are even gathering now. God's people are gathering through Abraham. God's people are gathering even now in the land of Israel. Some will repent and believe and some will not but the nation will be restored. Zephaniah is going to talk about that at the end of chapter 3. So this leads us to see that in all of this, both past, present, and future, God is calling a sinful nation, a sinful people to repent. And he's also encouraging the faithful. God encourages the faithful here in verse 3. 
Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered in the day of the Lord's anger. This is what repentance looks like, what faithful believers, both past, present, and future, are called to. The humble of the land here are, in other words, the, rem the remnant, those who remain faithful through the wicked times of King Manasseh and King, uh, I don't remember his son's name, but Josiah's dad, who was on the throne. They lived in very wicked times, and the king allowed wickedness and idol worship to happen. But there was a few, there's always a few, who stay faithful to the Lord. And God is now encouraging them through Zephaniah here. The remnant in Judah and Jerusalem are told to seek the Lord. Continue to seek the Lord. Continue to do what you've been doing. But do it even more so as you see the day approaching. Seeking here is really important. Not only because we see it three times once again. But the word means active. To be active. Look for the Lord. Go after the Lord. Don't just wait for the Lord to come to you. He already has come to you. Go and take what he's given to you and make something of it. Seeking means to search, to long for, to sacrifice something in order to get something that you know you should have. Ultimately, to seek the Lord here means to worship him and then to obey him. To worship God, we must know him. And how to worship him rightly according to his word, how he has revealed himself to be worshipped. So we must look to his word, we must know his word where he has revealed himself. We must proclaim his worthiness in song, in prayer, and in active service. When we come together to worship, we are coming together to say, Lord, you are God, you are Savior, and we are here to humble ourselves before you, to surrender our lives to you once again, and to do your will, not our will. And that should be represented even in how we worship during that time of worship service. Knowing God leads to proper worship. It is not some frivolous act that we can just kind of throw together at the last minute. I mean, would you appreciate kind of something like that, a birthday party at the last minute? None of us would appreciate that. We would not feel love out of that. But yet, how often do we come to a worship service unprepared to meet with God? We are here to acknowledge that the Lord is God. He is reaching out to us, he has reached out to us, and he continues to reach out to us. Worship is not about a polished professional service with professionals leading us. Worship is about us declaring with our hearts and with our voices and in our heads with accepting the word of truth that God is God, we are not, and that we need him, even as redeemed sinners, we need him. True worship is seeking to know him more, to love him more, and to serve him more. All true worship leads to righteousness and humble obedience. Righteousness means doing the acts that are defined by God as good and holy because of who he is. He is the standard of what is right and what is wrong. If he says this is right, then we do it. If he says this is wrong, we are to turn away from it. Worshiping him rightly leads to living humbly before himself and others. It's like Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. The one leads to the other. Seeking the Lord means having a relationship with him that leads to righteous living, that honors him and creates peace and harmony with others. That's what Micah the prophet talked about in Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. If you are walking humbly with your God, then you will be merciful, and you will act more just. We're not going to be perfect at it. The Lord knows that. He's provided for that. Does it mean that we cannot try to be perfect at it? He calls us to be perfect at it, to be holy. That's what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 6, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the more. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The poor in spirit. Those who recognize that we're nothing without God. Those who mourn over their sin and their sinfulness and the consequences of their sinful actions. Those who recognize that in my strength, in myself, I will sin. I need the power of God to help me live rightly so that I do not sin before others. 
and then hungering and thirsting for more of God and his truth and his word. That is what God is calling his people to do here in Zephaniah chapter 2. And that's what God has always called his people to do and always will call his people to do. That is what we're called to proclaim as we go out and share the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand and the time of judgment is coming soon. Now is the day of salvation. Repent and trust in the Lord before it's too late. Zephaniah is encouraging the faithful, showing the unrepentance what true righteousness and faithful living looks like. Those who know God are not afraid of judgment because they know God is taking care of their judgment. At the end of verse 3, Zephaniah says something that is puzzling. I almost don't want to bring it up. But I'm not that kind of pastor. At the end of verse 3, Zephaniah says, perhaps, or maybe, they would be sheltered from the coming day of the Lord. What does he mean here? Who is he talking about? I believe here that he's talking about the fact that there is no promise for shelter for unrepentant sinners. Period. If we do not repent, we will not be sheltered from God's judgment. And that the faithful remnant may experience some hardship or suffering due to the sins of others. Think about this for a moment. In the context of Judah and Babylon, there was a faithful remnant. Did they lose their city? Yes. Did they lose their temple? Yes. Were many of them carted off to Babylon for exile? Yes. They did not lose their lives. They did not lose their God. Many of them were taken. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Michelle, I think, I might get that wrong, Ezekiel, and uh, uh, undoubtedly others came, and they served the Lord and were faithful to the Lord in the land of Babylon. Jeremiah told the people uh, at the same time, he said, go to Babylon and go make a life there honoring the Lord that you might be a blessing to even your captors. That's what the faithful of the Lord do. The truth claim here is the same, I believe, of that of King David, who expressed in 2 Samuel 24, 14, when he said to his prophet, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. Do not let me fall into the hands of men. David said that after he had sinned against the Lord by counting the people, which was against God's word, against God's law. And so God said to him, you've got three choices. You get to pick your judgment, David. Famine, disease, or a nation's going to come and take you out. And he said, I will fall into the mercy of God. Because he knew who God was. He repented, and he knew who God was. And so he trusted that God would do what is just and right. And so he allowed the judgment that would come from God's hand directly to be the one that he chose. And what happens? God actually spares many people in Israel that day. Many did die because of the sin, but David repented. He built the altar that became the place where the temple would stand and the area in which God would bring ultimate salvation. Zephaniah is telling the unrepentant that their only hope is to turn to the Lord and trust in his grace for mercy from judgment. And he's telling the faithful, trust in God's grace and mercy in the midst of judgment. Yes, this is going to hurt, but God will pull you through. The faithful can always trust that God will be true to his word and to his nature. He does not forsake the righteous, those who fully trust in him. God in his grace calls sinners to repent, and he encourages the faithful. So what are we to take away from this today for us this morning? What does this mean for us as a church? I've already addressed a couple of issues, so I'm not going to go into those much more. But we need to, first of all, we need to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord, first of all. So seek the Lord. Can you honestly say that we, you, are seeking the Lord with all your soul, mind, heart, and strength? It begins by repenting of your sin. Yes, even as a believer, you need to repent of your sins. Not because you've lost your salvation, but because, as John says, anybody who says that they are not sinful is lying. Even we still participate in sin from time to time, and we need to repent of that, confess that, and trust that it's forgiven, and ask for help from the Holy Spirit and one another to avoid falling into those sins once again. 
If we cannot remember a time, a moment, when we became very much aware of our sin and sinfulness that caused us to turn away from that sin and embrace salvation in Christ, we need to do that today. I know many of you here in this room profess faith in Christ and you claim to have repented of your sins, and I trust and hope that that is true. But if there's any doubt, if your life is not characterized by one of faithfulness to God and holy living, increasingly so, repent of your sin and turn to Christ as your Savior. Trust in Him and what He's done for you. You will be forgiven. We all struggle with sin. We must be willing to humbly admit that, yes, I struggle with sin. And part of the reason for a community of believers is to help one another with our sins, which means we have to actually know the sins that we're struggling with. And I know that that's hard. And I know I say this a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's true. It's what the Bible teaches. We need to be willing to confess our sins to one another. Not just the sins that we commit against each other, but to say to a brother or a sister, help me. I, I struggle with this sin. This is a besetting sin in my life. I want to overcome this, but I'm struggling. Can you help me? And I hope and pray that we would be people that can do that for one another. We also need to worship in humility. Are we prepared to come to truly worship God? Not to hear a great message, not to hear great music, however that may be presented. That's not why we come. If that's why we come, then find a different pastor and we can do different worship music. We're here for Christ. We're here to proclaim that He is Lord and Savior. He is the only way to heaven. He is the only reason we're alive now and that we have hope for the future. We're here to be encouraged in holy living and to go out and to share with the world that is dying and destined for the fire of hell. There is salvation available to you if you will turn to Christ. Are we willing to come and experience that? It might not always be hands near praising God, hallelujah, all the time. It might be on my knees crying out, Lord, why did you even bother saving me? That's what it means to be the one who is mourning and blessed. That's what worship is. Coming before God and saying, God, have your way in me today. No matter how well done a worship service may or may not be, it's not about that. It's about how awesome and magnificent and praiseworthy our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior are. So may we die to self as we enter these doors for worship. May our desires be given up for the desires of the Lord. May we continue to be obedient. We seek the Lord by being obedient. What we hear, we try and strive to put it into practice. Dying to self that we might live out obediently God's truth in our lives. And then, as always, we're trusting him as our refuge. He is our shelter. He is our harbor. He is the one who wraps us under his arms like a mother hen brings her chicken, uh, little baby chicks together to protect them. No matter what the Lord may bring to us, we can be assured that he is a strong tower. And that ultimately, no matter what happens, we will spend eternity with him. I was reminded once again this week of the great statement. I don't remember who made it. It was not me. But we are all immortal until the day God calls us home to be with him. Think about that. You are immortal, physically speaking, until God calls you home. You don't know when or how that's going to happen. So why should we even bother with being so overly cautious? And I don't mean that we've got to go out and run around, drive 10 million miles an hour or anything like that, or run into prison camps or whatever and just hope and pray that, you know, we get to release all the prisoners without getting shot. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about where's our boldness for the kingdom? Where's our boldness in proclaiming the gospel? Do we truly believe that the kingdom of hell cannot stand up against the gospel message of the church, of Jesus? If he is truly our refuge, the chaos of governments and economies and militaries and culture that is going into the dirt all of the time cannot stop what God is going to do. We were just reminded in Sunday school this morning that the rock of Jesus has come and it's demolishing all the kingdoms of the world and his great mountainous kingdom is going to fill the whole world. We are a part of that kingdom. Trust him as your refuge during times of suffering and hardship, knowing that God is using that as a witness opportunity for others that they might know Christ and that you would be more like Christ yourself. The call to repentance for ourselves and to carry out to the world around us wherever we may be. 
I trust and pray that it's on your heart and mind and that you are encouraged to go and to call people to repentance and know Christ. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for these words. Reminders that this is serious. Sin is serious. And your salvation in Christ is serious as well. You are not playing around. We thank you for calling us to know your son Jesus. We thank you for calling us together. We were straw. We were sticks. But you have given us new life in Christ. We are now flesh and blood. We do not have hearts of stone. We have hearts filled with the Spirit of God. Father, embolden us, encourage us, help us to be the true worshipers that you've called us to be in Christ and empowered us to be through your Spirit. Give us the wisdom to go out into this world, to not be afraid of the darkness, for the darkness is not able to overcome the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your Son, our Savior. Help us to say what needs to be said with the right words, with the right attitude, that your truth will be heard and understood. Help us to remember that it's not about us, it's about the message. People hearing the gospel and responding in faith. We pray, Father, for those that we know and love who have yet to respond to the gospel. Father, we pray that you would open their hearts and minds, that you would use our lives as a witness and testimony, that they would see your real, that you're true, and that the sin and salvation is real, and forgiveness is possible, and that there is hope for eternal life in Christ. Help us to live that out in prayer, to worship you for it, for what you've done in us and what you can do through us. We thank you for all you've done in Jesus' name.